trees and they generally beautify the community with native vegetation, open space, and wildlife. Beautification is also a part of the Tahunga Spreading Grounds Enhancement Project's overall objective. Aside from recharging the aquifer, the renovation will allow for passive recreation on community open space. In LA this week. After championing the causes of Eastside families for 25 years, the group Inner City Struggle now has a permanent place to call home. I'm Gil Reyes with a story next. I'm Anna Marcos. These seniors are doing more than just enjoying dance moves. Metro is trying to get them on the move. And we'll tell you what that's all about coming up. How you can win some extra cash this summer all by driving safely. I'm Rasha Goel, and I'll have those details up next. Hey everyone, I'm Yana Kay. Here's what's happening on LA This Week. It was a packed house at LAPD headquarters as LA City Attorney Mike Fear welcomed Congressman Adam Schiff for the first in a series of programs called Conversations with Mike. The two men talked about key constitutional questions, including whether impeaching the president would do more harm than good. To impeach or not to impeach the president? The answer is split among Democratic presidential contenders as well as members of Congress. Before we embark on something of this seriousness, I think the question is, is this the right thing for the country? Uh, and that will be an absorbing and wrenching experience for the whole country. Democratic Congressman Adam Schiff sat down with Los Angeles City Attorney Mike Fear to try and answer the impeachment question. The crowd gathered here at Deaton Auditorium at LAPD headquarters to watch two veteran Los Angeles politicians who've been thorns on the side of President Trump. Of course, City Attorney Fuhrer successfully sued the Trump administration for attempting to withhold federal dollars as punishment for so-called sanctuary cities like Los Angeles. And then there's Congressman Adam Schiff, who as chairman of the House Intelligence Committee is one of the president's toughest critics. The administration has made no secret of its view that impeachment is a trap for Democrats as a political matter. Do you agree? If you don't impeach, then the progressive base is demoralized. Uh, there's a good argument to be made if you do impeach and he's acquitted and claims total exoneration that the progressive base is demoralized and doesn't turn out. In short, a no-win situation for Democrats, since the Republican-controlled Senate would almost certainly clear Trump during impeachment proceedings. Impeachment does not remove this president. There is only one way to remove this president and that is by voting him out of office. Uh, and that is an imperative second to none. While Democrats have yet to decide on a presidential nominee, the presidential election is set for November of 2020. For survivors of human trafficking, getting back on their feet financially and emotionally can be overwhelming. But a nonprofit called Two Wings is providing the hope they need to get back on their feet. We sat down with the director of Two Wings to get an idea of what victims are facing and how Two Wings is helping. It's a problem that impacts thousands of Angelinos, most of them women, many of them children. Today, the focus is on the fight against sex trafficking. It is estimated that there are around 10,000 victims of sex trafficking here in the Los Angeles area. Southern California is a major hub for trafficking, and this is of U.S. citizens. So often it is believed that sex trafficking happens overseas, or only foreigners are trafficked into the United States, but this happens in our very own backyard. How does the typical victim, male or female, or even a child, get pulled into this kind of activity? The most common is a boyfriend. 
a boyfriend usually you know goes about the regular courting you know you're beautiful I, I would like to get to know you better and then something will change or it could be that they come from a marginalized um, poverty stricken area and they are looking for money to take care of their family they will go to a trafficker or a well-known pimp for security or just for guidance or for help and then um, they are stuck in it that way as well. So the average age of a child coerced into modern day slavery or sex trafficking is 13 years old. So oftentimes these children, young boys and girls, come from family situations where either their relatives are also prostitutes or pimps or are no longer available, there, available to them to protect them and to watch for them. They're working, they're, whatever it may be. So the kids are left to their own devices. And a lot of these young girls are looking for a father figure. And here comes a boy that's a couple years older than them and starts to groom them. How difficult is it for victims to break away from this lifestyle? It's incredibly difficult. One of our participants in the past when she was actually able to escape, oftentimes they go right back and there's that vicious cycle again. It is because they have been so man mentally manipulated mm -hmm. that they feel like that is their family. They know that they're getting beaten, but then they start to feel like that's just commonplace. They know that it doesn't feel right to sell themselves, but that's just commonplace. They come from a life of trauma. So it's kind of hard to break them away from someone who they believe loves them and um, and that are there to take care of them because they, ha they don't really understand what that looks like. How did Two Wings get its name? So Two Wings derives from our motto, which is every bird has two wings, hope and courage. So our clients bring the courage and we provide the hope that lets them soar. And we just here to make sure that they have a safe place to uh, bond with people, to people to have support, <coughs> and people that actually believe in them, even if they don't believe in themselves. The City of LA and Microsoft teamed up recently for a high-tech camp a workshop that gave students the opportunity to learn about different technologies and possible careers in STEM. We're here at the Microsoft Playa Vista office in Los Angeles with several high schools and their juniors and seniors, and we're doing an immersive uh, technology experience with them. We provide a full day of STEM, coding, career counseling, um, career panel discussions, LinkedIn profiles. They're going to be actually with devices in their hands, they're going to have coding clinics, they're going to get real hands-on experience with professionals in the industry. This is an area that Microsoft is deeply passionate about, serving the communities and, and specifically underserved youth, to really try to bridge that gap between technology availability and to get kids excited about what they can do and the impacts they can have. The next generation of engineers are out there. You know, we have a, a, a tremendous amount of jobs that are available. And we're really excited to have the city participating this year. Um, so it's the partnerships that are involved in terms of impacting these kids have kind of grown. Being able to do this through government and schools is uh, core to our mission. We try to make it as fun as possible and, you know, let them understand that the opportunities are limitless. You know, the intent is to kind of spark the imagination, and once the imagination is sparked, anything's possible. These free high-tech camps are held in cities around the world. Power to the people just got stronger in LA's east side. As Gil Reyes reports, activists with a proven track record for social change finally have a place to call home in Boyle Heights. Whether it's pushing for more funding for East Side schools or mobilizing the Latino vote, the group Inner City Struggle has championed the causes of Latino families for 25 years now. And now the agency finally has its own headquarters with a youth center to boot. 
And with that, the East Side activists, known as Inner City Struggle, opened their new headquarters, a 6,000 square foot center in Boyle Heights. And this time, they own it. This is gonna, going to be our fourth location in 25 years. And the difference now is that this is our permanent home. So we'll be able to uh, be here without fear of, uh, of having to relocate. The group has championed several causes over the years. One of their biggest accomplishments placed college prep courses at Eastside schools that for years didn't have these classes. The building's new youth center will offer help with college applications. LA City contributed $1 million to help open the center at the request of Councilman Jose Huizar. If you look at their, the work they do, they're really a grassroots, bottom-up organization that takes their lead from the opinions and ideas and direction of parents and young people in the community. Any other issues uh, that, that this uh, group is maybe helping you on? I'd say like mental health resources. In our schools, there's not that many counselors or people that focus on mental health for students. Lincoln High School student Jacqueline Fajardo had complained about the lack of mental health workers on campus. And now, Inner City Struggle says it's working with the school district to improve services. Inner City Struggle says it will teach young people how to mobilize for other causes, such as elections and immigrant rights. So that they could be ambassadors uh, for their community. So that they can then use the skills uh, to go out and uh, outreach and recruit uh, more youth, uh, more of their peers to get involved. Eastside students are especially welcome at the new Inner City Struggle Youth and Community Center at 3467 Whittier Boulevard in Boyle Heights. The group also looks forward to educating more families about housing rights in increasingly gentrified neighborhoods. In L.A., car accidents are the leading cause of death for children ages 2 to 14. How can we help change those statistics? Well, Rasha Goel has more on a contest that's promoting safe driving with some fun prizes and driving tips. L.A. drivers, it's an easy way to win some cash while taking responsibility on the road. From June 3rd to July 26th, you can compete for cash with L.A. Safest Driver Contest. All you have to do is download the app. The purpose of this contest is to raise awareness and to educate the public on safe driving behaviors and to change driving habits to reduce traffic accidents and fatalities. From January 1st to today, we have handled 15,200 traffic accidents. Think about that. 15,000 incidents in less than six months. And so far this month, we've had six fatalities. What makes these statistics even more tragic is that we know many of these accidents are entirely preventable. Things like excessive speed, distracted driving, and driving under the influence of drugs and alcohol are all contributing factors to these accidents. The city has partnered with United Services Automobile Association and Cambridge Mobile Telematics for the contest. According to the World Health Organization, distracted driving has become a global epidemic. And all of us here are responsible for that. LA Safest Driver app will score your driving based on five things. Speed, acceleration, braking, cornering, and phone distraction. Yes, they actually have a way to track if you're using your phone while driving. So if you're serious about winning some cash this summer while you're driving, I would recommend paying attention to those five things. It will be activated based on phone movement and deactivated when the phone is turned off. At the conclusion of each entry period, the driving scores for each trip are totaled. The driver with the highest scores in the selected categories will receive cash prizes at the end of this campaign. There will be bi-weekly prizes as well as five grand prizes at the end of the contest. You can download LA's Safest Driver app from the App Store or Google Play. For more information, you can also check out LASafestDriver.com. Well, no more dodging cars to get across the street. Residents in the Fairfax District can now cross the street safely as a new traffic signal is installed on a very popular intersection.
staked it out one Saturday morning and my heart was in my mouth every time I saw a little group of kids running across the street. And I was just waiting to see a 10 year old get run over. It was a, a huge danger, and so we did everything we could to push it forward, and this is a great day now that we were able to actually formally light the signal. There we go. All right. It's also important because it is also the beginning of our bicycle friendly streets. Um, we got a grant a number of years ago to install some neighborhood scale uh, bike friendly treatments to make biking in our neighborhood safer and more pleasant. A little bike lane pocket as well as a uh, bike signal. Also really important because it's part of our larger plan to create these neighborhood greenways uh, through our area that will allow people to, to really have an enjoyable experience walking and biking through the neighborhood. Seniors get into the dance groove at this party. The hosts, Metro Art and Metro's On the Move Riders program, and while it's fun, it also helps Metro get more seniors to take trains and buses. Anna Marcos joins the bash at El Pueblo. These senior citizens are getting down and they get a little wild as they dance to the tropical beat of Susie Hansen's Latin band. A lot of people are dancing and the more they dance, the better we play. I wanted to enjoy myself. I'm going to be 88 and I want to enjoy myself all I can. And Tina Martinez is enjoying herself with double the fun. She's part of a mother-daughter duo. I'm getting my actor fly. The party at El Pueblo is part of the Raised on Records concert series for seniors, held at different places throughout L.A. County. It's put on by Metro's On the Move Riders program and Metro Art. Well, I, uh, I don't want to get rusty. It's good for memory. It's good for, it releases endorphins so you feel better. It's a way to um, just have fun with your fellow seniors. But this is about more than just fun dance moves. Metro wants to get these seniors on the move. And that's why it has about a dozen booths to show them how to get around town and have fun. Our On The Move Riders program strives to empower older adults to learn how to use the buses and trains. So we throw in some transit education with a little salsa today and to hopefully excite them about using public transportation. Many of these seniors are taking part in the On The Move Riders program and its network of social clubs, 30 all over the county. Some of these guys are even travel buddy volunteers. There's travel buddies to plan the trip. Uh, last week we went to the Universal City Walk. We took 15 people with us. Uh, we've been in Santa Monica, the beach. We've been twice of that. Good for seniors to get them out of the home. A lot of people kind of enjoy watching TV, sitting down, doing nothing. And we almost go home and knock on the door, some of my neighbors too, to get him out. And, and some of them are with us today. We enjoy um, being around people. A and, song uh, that I wrote. How many people We teach here them how to vote? get around on the bus if they've never been on the bus. Absolutely. To dance, to meet new people, to be active in any way is always a good thing. With senior outings like this, hopping on LA's trains and buses just doesn't get more fun. If you're a senior who'd like to know more about the On The Move Riders program, its clubs, or volunteer opportunities, visit metro.net forward slash on the move or call 213-922-2299. Well, he played a major role in the cultural history of Los Angeles from the 1800s to the 1920s. Charles Fletcher Lummis lived in Northeast LA and in 1907, founded the Southwest Museum, the first public museum in L.A. The three-day Lummis Festival honors his great contributions to our city. 
Lummis Days is, a, is the festival of Northeast LA, but it's a celebration of the diversity and the talent and creativity of Northeast LA neighborhoods. He named the festival after Charles Lummis because Charles Lummis was the first person to talk about the concept of multiculturalism in Los Angeles. He was a very seminal figure in LA history. First city editor of the LA Times, the city librarian very, very early on. This is the Southwest Museum, which was founded by Charles Lummis. Lummis also founded this place which, as the city's first museum, and also his home, which is just a few blocks away from here, Lummis home, uh, which he built by hand from River Rock as, as a city park as well. We're painting sort of the time that Lummis lived and back to actually the, the turn of the century. So we have models that go back to that era and uh, we're painting them uh, here at different locations uh, at Southwest Museum. Lummis fought to preserve Native American culture. He fought to recognize the contributions of Latino culture here in Los Angeles. He was very, very involved at a time when that was very unfashionable in bringing in other groups and forging a culture out here, a society out here in Los Angeles. When it comes to keeping your community clean, sometimes it does take a village. Residents in MacArthur Park rolled up their sleeves and helped clean their neighborhood. When Public Works comes in with a cleanup, we come in with everything. We come in with the trucks for bulky items, we come in to uh, paint over the graffiti, we get weed a bay, we give our trees, we uh, inform the community in different resources, we build groups and we build a, a community within a community on cleaning up and those that are interested in cleaning up. I, I just moved to the neighborhood and um, I hate walking to my car because there's so much trash on the street and I wanted to be a part of beautifying. Look at all these volunteers and this trash. None of these people even live in this neighborhood. They're coming from other neighborhoods to help us in our neighborhood. And I hope that my neighbors and the residents of this area take a look and sustain it. I like picking it up because I don't like people littering. That's making the park dirty. I feel like I'm a superhero and the park is in trouble and, I, and I'm saving it. Wherever we live, we want it to be clean. Please take care of your neighborhoods. They are the champions again. The Granada Hills community celebrates another national title. Students now have one less thing they need to pay for, and Metro adds more electric bikes to their fleet. All this in City Beat. Councilmember Greg Smith was on hand to celebrate Granada Hills Charter High School's seventh Yes, seventh U.S. Academic Decathlon National Championship in the last nine years. At the ceremony, a championship sign was unveiled showing passerbys who the current champs are. It's a great achievement that these young students have risen to the highest level of academic achievement in the United States of America. As part of a one-year pilot program, students from L.A. Unified School District and L.A. Community College District will be offered free dash bus passes. The LA DOT and council members Paul Kokorian and Mike Bonin collaborated on this program to help students cut extra costs. Why deal with the hassle of driving in LA when you can get around on bike? Metro just added 300 more electric bicycles to stations across the city. Download the Metro Bike Share app to find a nearby station and ride off to your destination. 
As we age, we can all use a little help staying fit and healthy. That's why the Department of Rec and Parks put on a health fair offering a variety of services to help our seniors live longer, healthier lives. We're here today uh, and we're collaborating with Humana. Um, because it's so important for our older adults to learn about fitness demonstrations, the fitness activities that are available to them through recreation and parks, as well as all the uh, resources that we have here from community and city and county to help them become more healthy, more active, for longevity. Humana has a partnership with the LA Parks and Recs uh, to help their seniors provide free educational information about health and wellness. Many people don't know all the benefits available to them, so we're providing this free service to them to educate them on the opportunity that they can uh, expand their Medicare coverage with Humana. I think health fairs are so crucial to engaging with the community. It's really a way to promote health and wellness, to, a way to drive people to be more aware of what's going on with their body and, and health as it pertains to the community in general. We have clinicians here that can talk to them about their health and make recommendations for them so they can seek their um, uh, and ask questions to their own health care provider. I think it's an advantage for people to come out and take a part in what's around them, in their surrounding area. Anytime you want to increase your knowledge about health and wellness, take advantage of it. Celebrate Pride Month with the first ever Pride at the Port event. Take part in an ancestor festival of the mass. And if you love bread like I do, don't want to miss the bread festival at Grand Market. All this in Things to Do. Come join Councilman Joe Buscaino and the Bridge Cities Alliance for the first annual Pride on the Port of Los Angeles. Hosted on the LA waterfront at the Battleship Iowa, this one-day festival welcomes everyone to join in on the celebration with cocktails, food trucks, dancing, and more. Pride on the Port LA has its maiden launch on Saturday, June 15th, beginning at 11 a.m. The event is happening at the Pacific Battleship Center, located at 250 South Harbor Boulevard, Berth 57. For tickets, visit ctickets.us. The Day of the Ancestors Festival of the Masks returns for its eighth year. This event brings communities together to honor the ancestors and celebrate culture from the vast African diaspora. Enjoy mask-making workshop and musical performances at the Day of the Ancestors Festival of the Masks happening Saturdays in June starting at 1 p.m. Festivities take place in Lamert Park Village Plaza at 4343 Lamert Boulevard. For details, check out their listing on eventbrite.com. The Los Angeles Bread Festival is back. Get ready to carbo load as Grand Central Market hosts the fifth year of this popular bread festival. This free one-day event is a celebration of SoCal's artisanal bread renaissance. This pop-up marketplace will be showcasing local bread bakers, as well as bread-centric workshops and demonstrations. The LA Bread Festival takes place at the Grand Central Market Saturday, June 15th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. at 317 South Broadway. For more info, visit grandcentralmarket.com slash events. And that's a look at some things to do. That's it for this edition. I'm Yana Kay. From all of us here at LA This Week, thanks for joining us. A reminder that you can catch us online at lacityview.org. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. See you next time for more of LA This Week.
Good morning, good morning. I wanna welcome everybody to uh, City Hall to this Los Angeles City Council. Today is Friday, June 14th. This council meets every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 a.m. The public is welcome. Madam Clerk, we do have a quorum. Would you call the roll? Blumenfield, Bonin, Buscaino, Cedillo, Harris Dawson, Weiser, Coretz, Krikorian, Martinez, O'Farrell, Price, Rodriguez, Rue, Smith, Wesson. 12 members present and a quorum, Mr. President. Thank you very much. First order of business. Approval of the minutes. Price moves, Martinez seconds. Next. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Bonin moves, Cedillo seconds. Continue. Mr. President, there is a request from a member to reconsider item two, which was council file 12, 1543 from Wednesday's agenda relative to the establishment of the Studio City bid. Okay, why can we hold that item and just move through the uh, other? And just move through the other agenda items. So we'll, let's just hold that for now. Uh, would council like to vote on reconsideration? No, okay, well then we'll just vote. You wanna take care of this right at this moment. I was saying we can't hold that and we'll go through the rest of the agenda first. I mean, if we can't, then we'll just vote on reconsideration now. So let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay, now this matter is before us. Again, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay, so we'll move this forthwith. Now continue through the remainder of the agenda. Thank you. And for items one and two, those are items noticed for public hearing. Do you have cards? Yes, there are cards on both items. Then let's hold those items and continue. Items three through 13 are items for which public hearings have been held. A budget and finance committee report for item 13 has been posted and circulated for council's consideration. And there is a request from a member to hold item 11 and 13. Let's hold those two items and vote on the remainder. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay, that brings us where? And Mr. President, there is a request to send items four, five, and seven forthwith. Okay, so ordered. That brings us where? That then takes council back to presentations, items called special or general public comment. Okay, I'd like to now defer to Mr. Smith the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. President, and it's an honor to be here today to recognize a number of people who served our country so well. 
I would ask the recipients today of the honorees that are being honored by various council members to come up to your council member and stand behind their desk, if you would, those of you that are being honored. Brad, you stay here. <laughs> I know there's some more, sir. Come on. Yes, the honorees. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, as we begin today, it's a great honor of mine to be here today as what I believe is the only veteran member of the Los Angeles City Council. I'm honored to pay tribute to our United States Army. As we begin today, I ask everyone in the audience to please stand and join with us as we have the presentation of the colors by the U.S. Army Los Angeles Area Recruiting Battalion and a rendition of the national anthem and then return and stay standing, please, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I call forward, please, if you recognize our great mayor's representative, Larry Vasquez, who is the mayor's veterans and military affairs director. Mr. Vasquez. Parade the colors. see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched we're so gallantly streaming, and the rockets regular, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you. That was Sergeant Tucker. Also bring forward Mr. Brad Klimovich, who is with the uh, Veteran of Foreign Wars, Granada Hills 2323. Comrades, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance of the flag of the United States of America. Present harms. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. Thank you. You may all be seated. Thank you so much. Post the colors. Ladies and gentlemen, on this day, June 14th in 1775, 244 years ago today, the Second Continental Congress took a first step in what would be the creation of the United States of America. 
A full year before the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the Congress voted to establish the Continental Army and appointed George Washington as commanding general, assigned the protection of the, what was then the 13 colonies of the, into a single organization. The formation of the army was the beginning of our union. In the 244 years since, much has changed in our country. But it is the United States Army, which remains <clears throat> the sole and only armed forces that was our original armed forces. While it would be impossible to tell the full history of the U.S. Army here today, it is the Army and the individuals who serve in it who have allowed our country to be born and grow and thrive. From Yorktown to Gettysburg to the beaches of Normandy, which we celebrated just last week or a week or so ago, the 75th anniversary, the landing in Normandy, the men of the Point de Hoc, the 82nd Airborne, these were the places that the U.S. Army has shared and shaped our history. Before Brown versus the Board of Education, the U.S. Army, along with all our military, was desegregated by order of President Truman. And because there's no fighting force that uh, compares to the U.S. Army in other branches, there is less armed conflict today and less death from war than at any time in world history. The Army is an institution that turns 244 years old today. In that history, millions have served. My father was in the Army Air Corps in World War II in Germany, flying over Germany. I served in the United States Air Force. My son served in the Navy. We are a military family, and I'm proud of it. On this birthday, we are lucky enough to be graced by the presence of a few individuals who have done so much for this country and served our country well. Before I introduce them, I'd like to call the director of the mayor's office once again, Larry Vasquez, for a few words. Mr. Vasquez. Thank you. Can we please keep it down? I'm not going to have any disturbances. You're disrupting this meeting. Last warning. Council President Wesson, distinguished council members, veterans, Lieutenant Colonel Flood, and members of the Los Angeles Recruiting Battalion, members of the 300th Army Band, service members, family members, friends and citizens of Los Angeles, on behalf of Mayor Garcetti, thank you for the opportunity to recognize one of the greatest institutions of our nation, the United States Army. For 244 years, the Army has been on watch, protecting and defending our freedoms, and we pause to recognize the service and sacrifice of the men and women who have served. A special thank you to Council Member Smith for his unwavering support for this event. Welcome to members of the Mayor's Military Veterans Advisory Council, Mr. Michael Dolphin and Joanna McFadden, both Army veterans. I would also like to recognize Carissa Gonzalez and her Army of USO volunteers who are here today and who have graciously agreed to sponsor this morning's events and future service birthdays. Since 1941, the USO has served as a home away from home for so many servicemen and women around the globe. The USO has a special place in my heart as it does for many others who have served. I had the opportunity to, even though I was in the Navy, to command a provincial reconstruction team in Afghanistan. And I remember on uh, my return home, uh, on leave, Christmas Day, I landed in Dallas, Texas, on my way back to California to see my family. 7.30 in the morning, Dallas, Texas. I thought there would be nobody in the airport. It was very quiet getting off the airplane. But as soon as I uh, cleared uh, the terminal, uh, there were about 30 members of the USO uh, there to welcome myself and some of my fellow service members home on Christmas Day. So uh, they're a very, very special organization. Uh, and while I love cake, and who doesn't, uh, this is an opportunity to recognize the members of our community who have made the US Army the greatest army in the world. Their selfless sacrifice through its, throughout its history has provided the bedrock of our democracy and for freedom for millions of people around the globe. As a councilman member, just last week we recognized the bravery of the men who participated in the D-Day invasion at Normandy that led to the liberation of Europe, the defeat of Nazi Germany, and the end of World War II. The Army has produced great leaders, leaders like General George Washington, General Ulysses Grant, General MacArthur and General Eisenhower, General George Patton, the California native, and General Norman Schwarzkopf and General Colin Powell. Their bravery is unparalleled, and 70% of our nation's Medal of Honor recipients served in the U.S. Army. I will let the Council's resolution speak to the many other heroic actions in history and heritage of the U.S. Army. 
and I am honored to serve as the Director of Military and Veterans Affairs in this city for Mary Garcetti, the city with the largest concentration of veterans in the country, and to recognize the members of our community who have served and contributed to the greatest army in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to begin honoring our individual recipients today. I'm going to start off with my recipient. So Brad, come up front and center, please. Brad joined the U.S. Army in 1975 and served three years in the Berlin Brigade and the 1st Infantry at Fort Raleigh, Kansas. Like many who signed up to service, he looked to the U.S. Army to learn a trade, and he credits this service with teaching him to become an honorary specialist. After finishing the service, he took those skills to the private sector where he made a career for himself in auto mechanic. And even though he hasn't been active in the service itself for over 40 years, he continues to serve where he uh, support the ser service members at post commander for VFW post 2323 in Granada Hills. For your service and your continued advocacy for the veterans, particularly in Tanasa District 12, it is my pleasure to honor you today and thank you for your service to the United States of America. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start with Ms. Martin Martinez. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Smith, and thank you for your leadership in organizing this presentation this morning. It gives me great pleasure to recognize my U.S. Army veteran, Honorary Maria Hernandez. Maria was born in Los Angeles, Maria's um, to her uh, Central American parents. Maria's parents traveled to the United States as refugees from the civil wars in El Salvador. Her parents settled, became citizens, and illustrated through their actions the importance of working hard and thriving in this country. During her junior year in high school, Maria became increasingly interested in joining the military. She would constantly talk to her parents about her interests, so much so that Maria encouraged her mother to tour a military base with her. It was there that Maria expressed her sincere intentions to join the ranks of the honorable military members who guarded and protect our country. Maria did not only um, not, al not allow her parents to say no, but she pleaded with them for this opportunity to join. They honored her decision and consented to her uh, enlisting in the U.S. Army. Maria enlisted upon her 17th birthday. She continued her senior year, and she enrolled in her senior year and shipped out to Fort Jackson in South Carolina, two days after her high school graduation. She illustrated leadership during her boot camp training by becoming a platoon guide and receiving an honorary recognition coin from her drill sergeants. After Maria completed boot camp, 9-11 took place. She wanted to continue serving and became the clerical staff at the newly formed 746 Quadromaster Battalion in Van Nuys. She juggled her military enlistment, two part-time jobs, and a full-time college enrollment. She traveled to Germany, Germany for additional military training and participated in Operation Gratitude, where she helped prepare personalized care packages for service members who were overseas. Maria was recognized and received an honorable discharge in 2005, all while completing and receiving her AA in sociology from Pasadena City College. Maria was not only the first generation U.S. born citizen in this country, she also became the first in her family to become a U.S. Army veteran and the first in her family to graduate with it from a four-year university. She is a proud Cal State LA alumni. Maria then spent most of her career working on Amanecer Community Counseling Services, which is a nonprofit mental health provider that services downtown and the Los Angeles area and its surrounding communities. In 2010, Maria and her husband became proud time, first time homeowners in Arlita. Maria continues to actively engage in her community as she has become a great asset of the Arlita neighborhood. She is actively pushed to make her community safer by advocating for more street lights and stop signs, tree trimming services, and how to pave our streets. Thank you for your dedicated work, Maria. Congratulations. We work so well with you, and we appreciate your service not only to our country, but to our community. You are a role model and a great leader in our community. We thank you for your service. Congratulations. Thank you.
Mr. Blumenfeld. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Councilmember Smith, for, for bringing the USO here to celebrate the birthday, the 244th anniversary of the United States Army. I think it's, it's spectacular that we're doing this. And I am honored today to be joined by Sergeant First Class Roscoe Frazier. He is here with his wife, who's sitting in the back, uh, Lila, and they are both residents of Winnetka uh, in my district. Roscoe has 20 years of service in the U.S. Army. And then after that, he did 20 more years of public service in D.C., working with D.C. Metro. He has amassed 32 awards and decorations over those years, including five Bronze Stars, three of which were for valor, two for meritorious service, his aerial gunner wings, a designation as master parachuter, and two Purple Hearts. He is well decorated, to say the least. The motto of the U.S. Army is, this we will defend, and Roscoe's career in the Army is a testament to his dedication to defending and serving this country. Together with Roscoe, his father, brother, and son all served combined 74 years with the military and 11 years of combat service. That's a family commitment. Roscoe served two tours of service in Korea, first in 1962 and then again in 1972. Between those tours, Roscoe served in some of the bloodiest and hardest fought battles of Vietnam, including Doc Tao, the Golden Triange, the Battle for Chu, uh, for Chu Chi, and Tai Ninh. Roscoe served as a helicopter gunner supporting the Vietnamese allies, bringing troops and supplies to and from the front lines. On his four-month tour of duty in Vietnam, he flew 479 combat assault and supply missions where he earned four air medals and an Army Commendation Ribbon. Most impressively, and a testament to defending his brothers in arms, was during one mission where he and 16 men stayed behind in an ambush patrol calling in artillery fire on the enemy. At one time, the enemy surrounded Roscoe and these 16 men under intense fire. Under artillery fire and helicopter covering fire, he fought through the encirclement, and all 16 of the men escaped unharmed. For that action, as squad leader, he earned the Bronze Star of Valor. This is only one of the many riveting stories and awe-inspiring stories from Roscoe's honorable and distinguished service. When you talk to him and you hear, he's got amazing stories. So thanks and appreciation are never enough for those who serve to defend American ideals, freedom, and democracy. I am proud that you're here today, uh, and I'm proud for all that you have done for us here. Uh, and if you want to see highlights of Roscoe's service, he brought along several display boards that will be in the rotunda. Uh, and so with that, I ask you to uh, give him a big round of applause. Thank you, Roscoe, for your service. Thank you. Continue, Mr. Bonin. I'm going to steal Mr. Buscaino's mic. There we go. Come on, a little bit. You can stand in between us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith, for, for doing this. It's uh, uh, a great pleasure to be a part of this. Um, you served for a number of years with another veteran. And uh, if Bill were here doing this, he'd reach into his desk and pull out his American Legion yes, cap uh, and try to outshine you. He did. Uh, he did, <laughs> yes. Um, so thank you for this. I'm, I'm here today actually with a, a, a dear friend of mine and actually a, a dear friend of Bill Rosendahl's. Uh, Bill Kuntz from Mar Vista. Uh, he's an Army Cavalry veteran uh, and is someone who has played an incredible leadership role in my district. I don't know if he learned his leadership skills in the Army uh, or if he brought them to the Army, but he's now bringing them to Mar Vista and to the 11th District as well. Uh, he served in the Army from 1990 to 1994. Uh, as a cryptologic linguist, and he spent the first half of his time in various schools, including the, the Presidio of Monterey, learning to become a Russian linguist. Uh, his journey to becoming a linguist was not quite a direct one. Uh, after he enlisted in the Army, he really wanted to be an Apache helicopter pilot, uh, and he was really, really looking forward to this. It was a dream, and then somewhere along the line, someone told him that he was too tall to fit in the cockpit. Uh, and so, as a result, he looked for 
uh, uh, another path to, to service, and he decided that linguistics was going to be it. Um, he's originally from, uh, is it pronounced Poolsboro? Paulsbo. Pa Paulsbo, Washington, uh, a small town of just 1,000 people outside of Seattle. Uh, and he enlisted in the Army after he broke his shoulder while playing football. Uh, he was stationed at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas in the 66th Military Intelligence Company, which was attached to the 3rd Battalion and the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment. He practiced electronic warfare, signals intelligence, and performed a variety of missions involving the collection, analysis, and dissemination of information. He earned the Army Commendation Medal, an Army Achievement Medal, and a meritor Meritorious Service Ribbon, and also competed in the International Language Olympics. Uh, after his four-year term, he moved to the West Side, where he has continued to support his fellow veterans and his community. Uh, Bill sits on the Board of Trustees for the nonprofit Adopt History, and that organization honors veterans through storytelling and helps them get the support and the, the assistance they need to maintain their lives. He also owns a retail construction company where he makes it a personal mission to hire as many veterans as possible. Uh, in addition to all of that, he is, is, is one of those people that, that we all have in our district who is, is a really special public servant, who finds uh, innumerable ways to contribute. Uh, he served for uh, eight years on the Mar Vista Community Council uh, and brought a, a steady and humble leadership to that at a, at a period of um, uh, uh, incredible stability and calm that we miss uh, back on the Community Council. He is now president of the Hilltop Neighbors Association. He is co-chair of the Pacific Area uh, 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 Police Advisory Board. Uh, he is a Cub Scout Den leader. He's a baseball coach at Mar Vista Park, uh, and basically just uh, making me look like a slouch dad by comparison to all the stuff he's doing. Uh, and uh, he has brought his Cub Scout with him today. Would you like to say anything about your dad? No. <laughs> Would you want to introduce your son? Uh, yes, this is Oliver. This is um, Oliver Kuntz, and this is Civics 101. <laughs> Uh, and we have a certificate. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Martin. I believe Mr. Cedillo has someone else still serving in uniform. Mr. Smith, let me uh, thank you for doing this event today. You know, uh, in the Latino community, public service and service to our nation is a really important value. When you grow up in Boyle Heights, it's one of the choices of life that you're expected uh, to make. And in my household, in my family, it's also been a, um, an important value. People are surprised sometimes that uh, I come from a, a household with such uh, rich history and serving our nation and I, I want to before I start with our nominee I want to acknowledge a few members of my family Danny and Robert Mossberg Guadalupe Delgado Danny Reese and his son Danny Reese uh, Dan Garcia Silver Star Medal in Vietnam and of course uh, my hero uh, my father uh, Gilbert Sainz to the 82nd Airborne uh, and it's just part of a rich tradition and so I thank you because uh, these men uh, committed themselves to put their lives on the line to save our and to preserve our nation and our democracy and we should never undervalue that particularly uh, at this critical time in the history of our nation. Uh, our hero, uh, our nominee today is someone who doesn't need an introduction but as you know uh, he deserves uh, an introduction. Uh, Bobby Arcos joined uh, the Army in 1979, and much like as I talked about, it's such a core value that when you grow up in the communities of Los Angeles, uh, it's something that's expected of you, it's something that's one of your choices, and so he served us uh, honorably from 1980 to 84. Uh, it's no surprise that he was a squad leader, it's no surprise that he uh, advanced in his training as a, a combat medic, that he was there to uh, serve us. Uh, he developed his leadership skills. He's 101st Airborne at Fort Campbell in Kentucky and left in uh, 84. As we all know, 
he took those experiences, he took those skills, he took that team building, that goal setting, those values, that vision, and brought it to the Los Angeles Police Department. And he has risen uh, through the ranks for 31 years, uh, continuing to be a person who puts his life on the line every single day that he leaves his home and goes out to serve the city. And so for us, uh, there was no question who would be uh, our choice uh, to uh, honor. Uh, he deserves it uh, every single day. He's risen to the highest ranks of leadership in our great Los Angeles Police Department. And in doing so, he hasn't just risen, but he's helped be the, the, right, the, the tide that's lifted the department. Uh, if you think of when he started at the end of the 80s, and the challenges that we've gone through as a police department to where we are now with a commitment to really serve the community, to change the models, to improve and enhance the, the manner in which we do uh, community policing. He's been part of that dynamic, part of that change, part of that progress. So it's with a great pleasure and great pride that we introduce Bobby Arco. Thank you. Mr. Harris Dawson, CD8. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith, and uh, we appreciate you for helping organize this uh, event to recognize the people in our community who put their bodies on the line for our behalf. Um, all of us only have one body, and so when someone puts that up, it's uh, always worthy of a recognition, and I want to congratulate everyone's honorees today. Uh, my honoree is uh, the one and only Mr. James Harris of South Los Angeles, uh, born and raised uh, in our community, in our neighborhoods, uh, lost his father at a very early uh, age and uh, struggled with anger and, and uh, rebellious activity. And uh, right outside the door were uh, the street gangs. And so dabbled a little bit of that and some folks in the community were able to get around him and get him into the United States uh, Army. Uh, where he served uh, for four years as a paratrooper uh, and served uh, with distinction in the early and mid-1980s as a part of the 82nd uh, Airborne Division. Uh, after completing uh, his military service and coming uh, back home, uh, those same street gangs and same influences were waiting for him uh, when he touched back down in our communities. And unfortunately, uh, is a part of his story that, that he does... Uh, not have any shame about. He got involved again and ended up doing uh, about s uh, doing some time in in s state of California prisons. During his time in prison, he turned his life around, leaning a lot on the values that he got uh, as a mil as a member of the army. And when he came out of prison, uh, he got involved in anti-violence campaigns and joined our uh, what the city of LA helped set up the gang intervention training program at Cal State Los Angeles, where you go and you receive official uh, certification. Um, since that time, he got out. Uh, he finished that program and became one of the leading gang interventionists in the city of Los Angeles, helping negotiate peace on our streets and being part of the team of people that has taken South Los Angeles and Los Angeles more broadly to the, some of the lowest levels of homicides and shootings that we've seen in any of our lifetimes. Uh, James uh, went on to serve in many other community capacity, including uh, being a neighborhood council leader uh, and just a general, I'll add, rabble rouser uh, in the community, making sure uh, all of our officials are doing what we need to do to keep the community safe, but also to recognize the veterans that were coming home. So he started the South LA Veterans uh, Collaborative that really organized around people coming home from the wars in the Middle East and in the desert. Uh, we had hundreds and thousands of folks coming home with really nowhere to go, and, and James led the effort uh, to make sure folks were connected, they could get their services, they could be a part of network, and to demand that we recognize them in the community. And so I ask uh, all of you to join me in, in uh, celebrating uh, Eighth District resident and Army veteran James Harris.
Thank you very much. Councilman Kretz, CD5 also has another person still in uniform. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Smith, and thank you for uh, bringing this whole presentation, uh, recognizing our, our veterans uh, here today. Um, it's my honor and privilege to recognize Lieutenant Colonel Steve Embrick, who retired from the U.S. Army Reserve on March 1st of this year after 29 years and 11 months of continuous service. Not only was he a hero to the United States Army, uh, but he continues to be a hero on the streets of Los Angeles as patrol captain of our beloved West Valley Division. Under his leadership, we've enjoyed a great relationship with his team and his command. Also, we want to welcome his wife, Rebecca, and his son, Alex, and daughter, Fiona, to the council chambers. Uh, Steve Embrick enlisted in the U U.S. Army in 1986 and served as an inf infantryman until he was commissioned as a field artillery officer in 1992. In 1994, he joined the California Army National Guard, where he served as field artillery officer in the Field Artillery Battalion. And his assignments included fire support officer, fire direction officer, executive officer, operations officer and commanding officer. In 1999, he completed the military intelligence officer's transition course and transferred to the 223rd Military Intelligence Battalion, where he served as a tactical intelligence officer in various duty assignments, including platoon leader, executive officer, operations officer, and commanding officer. And as an intelligence officer, he also served in the 519th Military Intelligence Battalion, Airborne, while deployed in Iraq. In 2010, he was transferred to the Army Reserve, where he was assigned to the 75th Division, and there he served as an intelligence officer, chief observer trainer, and brigade operations officer. Lieutenant Colonel Embrick's service includes deployments for Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. His awards and decorations are numerous and outstanding. And so on behalf of the city of Los Angeles, we proudly salute Lieutenant Colonel Steve Embrick and applaud his distinguished service to this country. Thank you. There we go, thank you. Um, today I'm going to be standing in for our friend Paul Kikorian who couldn't be here. And on behalf of Councilman Kikorian, I'm proud to recognize Gary Agass as Council District 2's honoree for the celebration today's anniversary of the U.S. Army. Gary Agass served as a sergeant in the U.S. Army Infantry Mechanized Cavalry Division, 1966 through 1969. During his service, he was deployed to Germany where he was stationed outside Nuremberg his cavalry troop was responsible for security of the Czechoslovakian border and long-range reconnaissance. While, on tour ended, while his tour ended in 1969, Gary's service did not. For nearly 20 years, he has remained committed supporter of the uh, fallen veterans as a veteran peer support facilitator to the vet to vet International Organization. Through his work, he has helped his peers overcome mental illness problems. Gary went on to co-found the vet to vet branch in the Sepulveda VA campus in North Hills, California. When Gary wasn't busy volunteering to help veterans, he spent his time serving the East Valley community as a Sun Valley Neighborhood Council member. For nearly a decade, Gary has helped improve the quality of life in our neighborhoods before returning, retiring from the Neighborhood Council board last year in, to continue his work at the VA. Thank you, Gary, for your profound service to our community, our country, and our waving dedication to our city and my district too. Thank you so much for all you've done on behalf of Councilman Corian. I'm proud to present this certificate to you and thank you for your service. You. And now Mr. Price, CD9. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, for this important recognition program and, and congratulations to all the honorees. 
Um, each year we have an opportunity to honor all veterans, but as you know, today is special because it's the U.S. Army's birthday and it's Flag Day. Uh, and the Army, of course, is the oldest branch of the United States Armed Services, uh, and some would argue that, in fact, it is the greatest. Uh, but my honoree is from the 9th District is uh, E-4 Specialist James Kemp, uh, who served in the United States Army from 1997 to 1985 as a dental assistant. Where are you, James? Yes. All right. He was awarded a special commendation for helping identify over 21 souls uh, who lost their lives in a tragic helicopter crash. Uh, he currently is enrolled at LA Southwest College at 60 years young. Uh, he is uh, dedicated to continuously improving himself so that he can improve our community. Uh, Specialist Kemp, thank you for not only your service, but for your continuing to work for the district and the community, making our city a place, a proud place to live. Thank you. Ms. Rodriguez, CD7. Thank you, Mr. Smith, and uh, and I, you know, I rise to celebrate and thank all of the servicemen and women who have heeded that call and uh, just gave so much of yourself. Uh, I know the families that have made that sacrifice as well. Uh, as a daughter of a veteran, I uh, I know all too well the stories of of the. Uh, suffering that the families go through as well in that time of separation. And so I just want to stand up and thank you all so much for your incredible service. Uh, to those of you that, if, if any of you have served uh, as part of the Vietnam conflict, I want to be the first to welcome you home. And thank you for your service. I'm proud to be joined today in honoring the service of my very good friend, Roger Rock Earl Swart, uh, more commonly just known as Rock. Uh, he served uh, in the U.S. Army and the California National Guard. And today we are fortunate to be joined by his grandsons, uh, Jacob and Ryan, and his son, Russell. Thank you for joining us here today. Rock served in the U.S. Army from 1961 to 1968. He completed his infantry and advanced inf infantry training at Fort Ord, California. He then returned to serve as a Sergeant First Class E-7 HHC in the 1st Battalion, 160th Infantry in Glendale. He served for seven years and four months before being honorably discharged on December 28, 1968. In 1965, his Glendale unit was activated during the Los Angeles Watts riots. He spent, uh, his, his unit spent seven days and six nights in Watts. His assignment was to protect our LA city firefighters from harm's way and he was happy to report that no firefighters or guardsmen were injured during his deployment. I'm very grateful for Rock's service. In addition to not just being a, a very active member of our community, he also volunteers in my office once a week uh, to support our work, uh, the critical work that we do in the city of Los Angeles every day. He serves in the Sunland Tahunga office. Uh, we are better for knowing him and we are better for his service. Thank you, Rock. Thank you very much. Ms. Rue, CD4. Uh, thank you, Councilman, Councilman Smith, um, for, organizing this, for organizing this very important presentation and for recognizing our U.S. Army service members who deliver the highest form of public service. <clears throat> My honoree for Council District 4 is Army Personnel Specialist Diane, Diana Leanne Wilson. Diana joined the U.S. Army when she was 20 years old. Born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, she followed in her father and her grandfather's footsteps by enlisting and serving at Fort Richardson in Arkansas. <clears throat> after, her, after her service in the Army, Diana moved back to her hometown of St. Louis where she discovered a love of acting. She soon moved to Los Angeles, where she worked in network television for, for the past 15 years. 
It was through working in TV and film that Diana found her true calling, serving the veterans community. It was through the entertainment industry that Diana met many other veterans and became involved in a veterans group. She joined the Writers Guild Foundation Veterans Project and the USVAA, where she was the first female veteran to stage, stage manage Tracers, a play that is written, directed, and acted entirely by veterans. She soon, she soon joined the Veterans and Media and Entertainment, which works to connect veterans to the entertainment industry, gaining them a foothold in solid employment and upward mobility. It was through the Veterans and Media and Entertainment that she became involved in the American Legion Post 43 in Council District 4, also known as the Hollywood Post 43. The Hollywood Post 43 is one of the greatest American Legion's posts anywhere, and certainly a place I'm proud to support in Council District 4. Diana was recently named adjutant at the post, one of her proudest moments as she joined uh, a legacy set by her grandfather, who was the commander of his American Legion post. Diana proudly serves under the newly elected post commander, Jennifer Campbell, who is the second only ever female commander in the post 100, post 100 year history. I am so proud to recognize Council District 4 Army Veteran of the Year, Diana Leanne Wilson. And now last but certainly not least, the President of the City Council has a special friend of his and mine. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, for this day. And I can't say enough about all of the veterans who ensured that uh, all of us were, were safe. I'm proud to be a son of a veteran myself. My uncles were veterans, and I think they were veterans in hopes that I would never have to, to be. So I am appreciative. But the reason why I am standing before you on this day, standing in this spot, is because of the man that's to my right. And please give a round of applause to former councilman, former state senator, Nate Holden. Give him a round of applause. When nobody members, nobody would give me an opportunity to get into this line of work. He was the only one that took a chance on an index, inexperienced little fella from Cleveland, Ohio, and gave him the opportunity to learn how to be a public servant. He was born in Macon, Georgia and at the age of 10 moved to Elizabeth, uh, New Jersey, which was a very tough part of town. And what a lot of people don't know about my boss and my mentor and the man that raised me in this business is that he dropped out of high school at the age of 16 and joined the Army where <laughs> under age, lied about his age, joined the army, served in Germany and Italy, and he became a military police officer then. <laughs> he then returned, went to night school, got a degree, became an engineer working for Hughes Aircraft, and my boss friend, mentor, Nate Holden, was one of the engineers that helped put Surveyor on the, on the moon. They were having problems, and it was Councilman Holden that came up with a special attachment. He served for 30 years as a public servant. He was elected to be the state senator in 1974, and it was my greatest opportunity when he was elected to the city council in 1987, and he selected me to be his chief of staff. 
One of the other reasons why I'm so glad, Mr. Smith, that you did this on this day, because tomorrow will be the councilman's birthday. He will be celebrating his 90th birthday. Let's give him another round of applause. So it is my honor, and I never thought I would have an opportunity like this to honor the person that is really responsible for me even being here. My inspiration, a man that would call me first thing every morning and a last thing every night and make me review everything that we had done that day. Called me first thing in the morning to make sure I read the newspaper the right way and interpreted it. Would call to make sure that I was at events. Would call and tell me to meet, meet him at an event. I would get there and he'd say, oh no, I'm not coming, you handle it. <laughs> a man who trained me, a man that I love and a man I have the highest respect for. And that's my boss and friend and men mentor, Councilman Nate Holden. Let us uh, recognize him as uh, one of our great veterans for this great country. Councilman Nate Holden. And as a point of personal privilege, and since he said, I believe, when he first got here in your chair, Mr. Weez Mr. Weezar, Councilman, a moment. Don't break my mic. Oh, this may take a Thank you, Mr. President. Once again, it's glad for me to be here in the council to celebrate this veterans who gave all God gave them to serve America, to keep us all free. Uh, I got to tell you, uh, our first enlistment to the military in 1943, and when they discovered that I was only 14 years old, they decided to take me, but Uncle Sam said, we want you. <laughs> so in 16, I found a way to get in. But very briefly to say that as a military police officer serving in Germany, Italy, I went to the place I hoped to be, that never existed, Dachau in Germany, the concentration camp. Imagine a 16, 17 year old kid going in there and saying, seeing all those things that were evil to mankind that existed in our society here on the planet Earth. And then I had to get a prisoner, bring him back to Italy. We had the Nuremberg trials, my boys, guys was there as well. And then we tried them. You know we did what the other guy did. We didn't always hang them, we shot them. In my outfit, we had a, a firing squad. Now, we just have to do things. You know, the enemy is the enemy. We believe in freedom and justice for all. We pledge to take the oath, protect the interests of the United States of America against all enemies, all foreign and domestic. We believe in that. We are gung-ho. Okay, thank you. All right, give it up for Councilman Nate Holder. And again, Councilman, happy birthday tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow night. Mr. President, to conclude this day's event and as recognition of our United States Army, I'm proud to bring to the podium for a few remarks Lieutenant Colonel Patrick. Flood. I'd first like to thank uh, President Weston and the LA City Council and LA's Director of Military Affairs, Larry Vasquez, for inviting us to celebrate the Army's birthday. We look forward to continuing a partnership with the City of Los Angeles, knowing that both the U.S. Army and City have the same goals for our young people. Educate them, prepare them for their futures, and give them opportunities to follow their dreams and succeed. In 2001, I was a resident of West Los Angeles when I joined active duty Army as a signal officer. It's been 20 years that I've served since, or almost 20 years that I've served since, and now I'm back in LA, able to serve the community once again. During that years of service, 
I've received the Bronze Star for Valor and the Purple Heart. As a Special Forces Officer, I was able to lead teams in Afghanistan, Peru, Colombia, Guyana, and Honduras. Thank you for your service. As a U.S. Army soldier living in Los Angeles, I am grateful for those words, which I hear often while wearing my uniform in the community. What many people do not understand is that I am the one who is thankful. I'm thankful that my fellow soldiers and I have been protecting freedom's front door for the last 244 years. I'm thankful to belong to an organization that swears to defend the ideals laid out in the U.S. Constitution, those of liberty, justice, equality, and democracy. Those ideals are not yet fully realized and always threatened from without and within. So I am thankful that over 10,000 young men and women from Los Angeles have joined the U.S. Army in the last three years. And like me, they represent 27% of the population who are even eligible to serve and the 1% who chooses to do so. Young people like Luis Barejas from James Monroe High School, he will be a wheeled vehicle mechanic. Robert Bagalawas from Cabrillo High School, he will be a human resource specialist. Alondra Aguiano from Panorama High School, she will be a combat engineer. Or friends Jose Avila, Daniel Romero, and Floraren Ogutayo, who joined the Army under the buddy system, will be Patriot system operators. All five graduated at the top of their classes, were student leaders and athletes. They represent the best of Los Angeles. They represent the diversity that makes the Army and the world great. Our 50% of today's, about 50% of today's young people admit they know little or nothing about the nation's military. The people who work daily to protect their freedom. They don't understand the depth of the knowledge and technical skills that they can learn in 150 different career paths. They don't understand the degrees they can earn or the benefits and perks that often match or surpass those offered by civilian employees. It is the goal of the Los Angeles Army Recruiting Battalion to find our future military policemen, cybersecurity professionals, paramedics, human resource specialists, logisticians, nurses, engineers, truck drivers, and IT specialists, not just our infantrymen and special forces soldiers. The Army invests in its people, often to the benefit of outside organizations. Veterans are more likely to vote, volunteer, and become involved in their communities, as has been witnessed today. They have the maturity and self-discipline private industries are seeking. The U.S. Army has partnered in the last few years with LA Metro, the LAPD, Cedar sinai and the LA Sheriff's Office, just to name a few of our partners, to help return our veterans to Los Angeles. And not to forget the creative artists industry in Los Angeles, there are a few Army veterans we'd like to recognize who have made a creative impact to Los Angeles. Those include Jen Levita, painter, Ice-T, actor, Brian Anthony, screenwriter, Clint Eastwood, actor and director, Robert Altman, director, Tim O'Brien, author, Tim Abel, actor, Alicia Dietz, sculptor, Lou Rawls, musician, and Keith Jeffries, author. The Army would like to use the opportunity of its 244th birthday to make a nationwide call to service. The 317 soldiers and civilians in your Army Recruiting Battalion are at your service and looking forward to engaging every educator, community leader, and member of the community who cares about freedom and opportunities for young people. We will be honored to help you, and we need your help. Thank you very much. God bless Los Angeles the United States Army, and the United States of America. Thank you, Colonel Flood, and it is our honor, all of us, sitting here today, to say thank you to the United States Army and all the branches of the military who make it possible for us to sleep at night under the, under the blanket of freedom. For all you do, for all the service you've done, in 244 years, the United States Army, we present to you this Proclamation recognizing 240 years of 44 years of service. God bless you. Thank you.
Mr. President, with your permission, if we could have all the recipients come forward and the members of the council join us for the cutting of the cake. We don't have 90 candles for Mr. Holden, but we want to cut the cake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And that would Let's, conclude uh, our service. Thank you, if sir. If everybody uh, in the horseshoe which, and the uh, honorees would go to the center table. On in, Councilman Cedillo, you need to be okay, in can you closer. Can my, my there we go. Oh, but I can't see. Okay. Okay. Can uh, you can you maybe go over to this side? I can't. I don't know. I can't see you guys. I can't. Oh, I can't even see you. Okay. I need to get up or something. But you know what? Let me go grab a ladder. <laughs> Okay, the uh, Army Band, Mr. Smith, will be playing, uh, is it in the rotunda? In the forecourt, and uh, the cake is going to be moved out there. One more round of applause for all our veterans. Thank you so very much for your service to this great country. Thank you. I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Price for an introduction. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. We are extremely honored today to be joined by two friends of our, of our country and, and of our city. First of all, Dr. Bernholm Miskal Sergi, who is the new Council General here in Los Angeles from Ethiopia, right behind us. And we're especially excited to welcome the Honorable uh, Dr. Fusum Ariogu, who is the new ambassador to the United States from Ethiopia. Let's give them a hand. <clears throat> the ambassador has over 20 years' experience in serving uh, in government. In the years prior to his current role, uh, he held positions in the office of the Prime Minister at different capacities as team leader in the Economic Affairs section, special assistant to the head of Economic uh, Affairs, uh, to the Deputy Minister, Assistant Bureau Head of the Capital Budget Projects Bureau and Head of Planning and Management. He's also served as the head of the Addis uh, Ababa Investment Agency uh, and the uh, Investment Bureau, that, and he has served on um, 
different public enterprises as board chair and member simultaneously. Most recently, he served as chief of staff to Prime Minister Ahmed. Let's give uh, the ambassador a very warm welcome, members, and welcome him to Los Angeles and to our country. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much, Honorable Council President Herr Wilson, Honorable Council members, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm very honored to be here this morning and to bring my warm greetings to you all from Ethiopia, the land of origins. Coffee is one of them. Whenever you see coffee, remember Ethiopia. Thank you for inviting me and my delegation. This is my eighth week as ambassador of Ethiopia to the United States. And uh, I couldn't wait to pay a visit to your vibrant city known as a city of angels. In our continent, Africa, and in my country, Ethiopia, you are well known by your amazing creative industry, the Hollywood. As one of the oldest countries in the world, Ethiopia has many stories to offer to this industry. Ethiopia is the first country in Africa to establish formal diplomatic relationship with the United States, and to be exact, it was in 1903. We are also hopeful to establish special relations with the city of Los Angeles and with that hope, I am here, and I will be meeting Honorable Mayor this afternoon. We invite you, sir, all council members and all Angelinos to come and experience the land of origins, Ethiopia, which is also the political capital of Africa. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Thank, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your uh, positive, positive relationships uh, between our countries and we wish you continued success. Thank you so much. Madam Clark, we're going to continue with our presentations. Mr. Wesson, whenever you're ready. Thank you, uh, Madam President and, and, and members. And if I could get some of the team to come up, uh, stand around with me today. Uh, members, June is uh, African American Music Appreciation Month, and so I'm bringing to you a tradition that we've done for the past several um, years, and, and I'd like to present to you uh, Linda Morgan and the Living Jazz Legends. Could we please give them a round of applause? <laughs> jazz is a universal language that that brings the world together and it's something that we invented and we uh, perfected. We are so honored to have this organization with us today. I say this every year, but I can't say it enough. They make sure that young people, that they pass this knowledge down to our younger generation so that there will always not only be an appreciation of jazz, but a knowledge of jazz and new jazz artists as well. And so today, we are honoring two living, living legends. So we have a blues guitarist, Ray, where's Ray? Ray, uh, Ray, Ray. Right here, give Ray a round of applause, Ray Brooks. And a blues bassist, uh, Leroy Martinez. Where's Leroy? All right, to my left. 
and it's something cool about being a jazz guy. You just see they got the hats and all of this is just. But what I'd like to do is, uh, Albert, if I have the, uh, I'd like to present them. There you go, Ray. And then if somebody could give a hand to Mr. Martinez over here. What I'd like to do is uh, ask to come up and say a few words. A woman who is the driving force uh, behind this for over 10 years, recognized the importance of keeping this alive and passing this on to our young people. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause for Ms. Morgan. Let's give her. Who, by the way, I'm glad she was here today because she served as a sergeant, right, in the, in the Marine Corps. So she should doubly get a round of applause for being a veteran as well. My name is Linda Morgan, and it is my pleasure, thank you, sir, for allowing us to be here to honor our history the legacy of jazz and blues legends. Mr. Ray Brooks here to my right, Mr. Leroy Martinez here to my left. And we have a host of others that came here to say hello yeah. to you, President Wesson. We have Billy Mitchell. We have the love interest of Mr. Ooh, why did I draw a blank? Mm -hmm. Jimi Hendrix, oh love interest. Goodness. Rosalie Brooks here. Lord of mercy. Mr. Greg Wright, guitarist from Michael Jackson's band. Sammy Lee in the house. Curtis Kirk. It is so many of them that came, dab dab, to come and I'm to celebrate this 10 years of doing this work here in the city of Los Angeles, honoring and paying tribute to these legendary jazz and blues musicians who give their all and give back to our next generation so that it can continue. Please help me applaud all of them, and thank you again, sir, for having us all here in the City Council this morning. Uh, give them one more round of applause, and it's our honor. And Mr. Weston, Mr. Weston, we have one member on the queue that'd like to say a few words. Okay, but I, I'm gonna, I gotta, I'm gonna tell uh, my staff to go to my car and find some Jimi Hendrix music now. <laughs> look, look for a band of gypsies, all right? Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's the right one. You know yeah. your music. <laughs> All right. <laughs> 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 oh, cool. All right. Mr. Price. Thank you, Madam President. I just want to uh, thank the President for uh, bringing this outstanding group of individuals uh, before us today. Special shout out to Linda Morgan, who has just done an extraordinary job yeah. making sure we keep the legacy alive. So thank you, thank you, Linda. Uh, and thank you for all for these pioneers that are with us uh, who have just really led the way, uh, both as professionals, but also as community activists. And so I just want to thank you all for doing what you have done, uh, creating a legacy, creating a history, uh, and creating an opportunity for others. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and I'm reminded, I'm reminded, uh, Ms. President, that uh, July the 27th and 28th, we're going to be celebrating the 24th annual Central Avenue Jazz Festival. All right. Uh, many, that's right, many of you have been a part of that over the years, and so we look forward to seeing you again and, uh, and wish you well in all your endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price. <laughs> okay, Mr. Where's Mr. Smith. Let's go to the... This Albert. Albert is Mr. Wesson. Mr. Rue, are you ready for your presentation, sir? Mr. Rue? Can 
now Come have our sergeants please quiet the room down, please. Good morning, Madam President and colleagues. <clears throat> and I want to wish everybody a happy Huarang Youth Day. <clears throat> I am honored to be joined today by Howard Park, founder of Huarang Youth Foundation, Daniel Kim, the summit chair of the Huarang Youth Foundation, and all the Huarang members and family that are here today. Let's give them all a round of applause. <laughs> Many of you are probably wondering, what is Huarang? Huarang literally means flowering youth or flowering knights, and its roots go back to the 10th century in Korea. Founded in ancient Korea under the Shila kingdom, this group of young warriors strived to form a well-rounded individual. People who would help society, take a vested interest in building up their community, and build the leaders of tomorrow. Today, Modern Day Hwarang Youth Foundation has over 6,500 members and branches all across the world, including many here in California. Founded in 2006, Hwarang serves as a youth empowerment center a force that beautifies and improves our city and a source of pride for the Korean American community. Hwarang is based in the five beliefs of love. Love of family, love of country, love of neighbors, love of justice, and love of peace. Through these pillars, Hwarang Youth Foundation leads their students to become productive members of society and compassionate leaders dedicated to serving others. The lessons they teach are not just for young people, they are the lessons we can all learn from. The idea that to lead a full life, you must first contribute to society. You must carry the concerns of your neighbors, just like your own, and you must do your part in making this world better. In Los Angeles, the Huarang Youth Foundation cleans up Griffith Park. It provides volunteer medical services and are often seen playing Korean cultural music for the, for the public. Through their dedication to the next generation, leaders like Howard and Daniel elevate the entire Korean American community and help Los Angeles thrive. Now to say a few words, I'd like to invite the summit chair of the Hwarang Youth Foundation and high school student, Daniel Kim. Good morning. Um, it is my honor and my privilege to be standing here in this position today. Um, it is no surprise that um, we have come this far. It was about 1,500 years ago, the year was 552. Two young 16-year-old male uh, students made a vow uh, to themselves and to each other that they would stand up for, first of all, their family, their country, and everyone around them. Jump ahead 1,500 years later, and our modern or organization has become the epitome and the embodiment of what they stood for 1,500 years ago. And it is, um, I'm only a high school graduate as of three days ago, but I believe that as I move ahead uh, through the rest of my life, I am fully confident and the people behind me are fully confident that as they continue to live uh, in this world and all it has to offer, that we can fully be we can be very confident and move forward and be the leaders that our world needs. I myself have an eight-year-old brother and I feel like it is my responsibility to be a mentor for him, a teacher for him, a leader for him. And ultimately it's based on what I have learned through the 18 years, the short 18 years of my life. The Huarang Youth Foundation was founded in 2006 and it has been a very long 13 years, and yet a very brief 13 years. 13 years has gone by very quickly, and it is just amazing to see how much our foundation has grown and expanded all over the globe. Today is significant for just a couple of reasons. First of all, it's, um, it's kind of like a celebration of all the things we were able to accomplish uh, ever since our founding in December of 2006, but also it's a testament to what we have been able to accomplish, the legacy we are able to leave behind, 
And although I leave this organization as of tomorrow, um, I'm fully confident that in the years coming forward that our legacy will continue to build and the leaders and our members will continue to develop and will ultimately be the leaders of our community, our country, and all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Well said, and congratulations on your graduation. Up next, I am so honored to invite the founder of Harang Youth Foundation, and that's Mr. Howard Park. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Good morning, council members. Uh, you know, I'm standing for here, so I'm really proud of all of the, my Harang members, and also all of the world, my members now. So special today, from the Europe's, my members come here, and uh, even the Central America's members are here. So I'm proud of so my, uh, with my members. So especially, uh, I'm thank you so much, David Liu, and also as my members. I know Monica Rodriguez, I know operas. All of my city members will be together with So today, you guys invite for me here. Thank you so much. That's what I can say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. And you know, I, I do want to recognize, I mean, Huarang is worldwide. And we have members from Uruguay, right? Uruguay and yeah, Guatemala. And Guatemala here. Uruguay, Guatemala. Come, come raise come, your hands. Come, come, over here. come over here. Come over here. So the Huarang Youth Foundation is worldwide. Ukraine, Ukraine, not, not Ukraine, Ukraine, not Uruguay, sorry, Ukraine, <laughs> Ukraine and Guatemala, so I uh, want to uh, recognize them as well, uh, thank uh, Huarang Youth Foundation, and today we celebrate Huarang Youth Day uh, in, the, in the city of Los Angeles, and you see them all the time, when you're, whenever you see them wearing all these volunteers in yellow shirts, or is it red? No, no yellow. Ye all the yellow shirts, you know who they are, Huarang. So thank you so very much, and we proclaim Huarang Youth Day in the city of Los Angeles today. Thank you. Madam Clerk, that concludes our presentations. Uh, we're going to move on to um, cards, but did you want to, do you have an announcement? Um, Madam President, amending motions 11A and 13A have been posted and circulated for council's consideration. Okay, thank you. Mr. City Attorney? Uh, if somebody wishes to um, give public comment on 11 or 13, I recommend we do so. Take co public comment on items 11 and 13. Let's go ahead on multiple cards. Antonia Ramirez, are you still here? Come on up, ma'am. Okay, Ms. Ramirez, you're speaking on items 1A, number 2, 11, and 13, and general public comment. Um, start the clock already. Uh, let's see, number uh, 11. Uh, number 11, please. I say no to all bridge housing projects. The city, because first of all, the city houses all criminal motherfucking assholes, i.e. skid row motherfucking niggers, and the chango Latino gangbangers, the wetbacks, the white trash junkies, and the faggot lesbo trannies who steal, violate, attack, bully, mow, and are mostly infected with AIDS, MRSA, scabies, bed bugs, staph infections, and pulmonary lung infections, and all kissing diseases. They are highly contagious and deadly. Uh, so they don't first house the city. They don't first house military military veterans and law-abiding citizens and homeless, chronic homeless individuals. And number 13, um, one, mo one moment please. Um, again, 
This homeless and poverty committee is nothing more than a homeless uh, racketeering. Again, you do not pro you know you do not provide emergency homeless aid for really individuals who are out there suffering from the from the crimes, the human degradation, the airborne and the all the infestation that people are subjected to out there by these motherfucking niggers, gangbangers, wetbacks, and all the criminal motherfuckers. Again, you are not providing emergency programs to law-abiding citizens who are truly homeless and are not in any way, shape, or form involved with these fucking criminal motherfucking elements. And how, it, I, and you keep asking for more money? Please, no money to Los Angeles for any homeless issues because they're not providing the assistance to those who are truly homeless, especially women who are subjected to crimes by these motherfucking wetbacks, gangbangers, and all the goddamn niggers and the goddamn trannies. The bullying and all this that we're subjected to is in atrocious. No one does assist us in any way shape or form what we want is emergency protection from these predators the niggers the wetbacks the gangbangers the trannies and all the motherfucking um, individuals who do not help make homelessness any better so again individuals that need to be picked up put in jail or rehab not house um, and those of us who do need protection and provide safety are thus we should be provided with all sorts of amenities, but we're not. We are ignored, we are violated, and furthermore, the fucking mayor and all his political, unethical, pandering pussies like Herb Wesson, the niggers, and the NAACP, the uh, Black Lives Matters, and all the Jew motherfucking Jews, what they do so is I, they set, they send people out to attack us, violate us, so rob us, I, hit I us, we're, and we're steal from us. Topic. This this is a daily occurrence to shut us topic. up and not allow us to come to the city. So, okay. And, and would you would you do me a favor, Ms. Ramirez? Don't don't shout into the mic, please. Oh, I, I'm sorry. You got your one general. Your I'm one sorry. minute of general. Public Thank you comment. very much. Uh, fuck you, unpatriotic, un-American, un unethical, diabolical, evil, satanic, masonic, elite Zionist Jews, and elite non-Jews, political pandering, corrupted motherfucking pussies, and may they kill, kill, kill all of you and your families for committing crimes against humanities with high treason and for stripping middle-class America and our beloved United States military veterans to massive and chronic homelessness and poverty with human degradation and high crimes and they are fucking Herb Wesson, Mark Gridley Thomas, the NAACP and um, Black Lives Matter and Black Panthers, City Attorney Michael Fuhr, Adam Schiff, Eric fucking Garcetti, the Jewish World Congress, the ACLU, Judges, Attorneys, Commissioners, the Israeli Mossad, Sheila Kuhl, the faggots, trannies and lesbos and all those, uh, i.e. the church, the Vatican who sodomized the American children in America and the Chabad, the fucking FBI. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez, your time is up. Thank you very much. God bless America. Uh, Sean Murphy. Hi, Sean. Sean, you've, you're speaking on items 1A, items 2, 11, and 13, and general public comment. Item 1A, support. General public comment. Oops. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, as you know, I'm in the midst of moving out of two. I want to send a shout out to Kukorian. Please tell him I'm moving out of CD2. I want to thank him for being my councilman. Sorry, Mr. Mr. Murphy, could you hold on one moment? So, Ms. Ramirez, Ms. Ramirez, we can and. Uh, Hold Please on, Sean, if we could ask our officers to meeting. remove Ms. Ramirez. She is completely disrupting the meeting. So, uh, <coughs> officers, could you please remove her? Yep. Uh, Ms. Ms. Ramirez, on. you've been ordered removed because you're disrupting the meeting. Would you please leave quietly now? Okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Murphy. We have to hold while this is being dealt with. Okay. Ms. Ramirez is still in the back of the room shouting. Uh, 
Ms. Ramirez is continuing to completely disrupt this meeting and yep. halt us from proceeding with any of our business. Sorry, Mr. Murphy. Yeah, uh, let's I, I got to get going to, to Our Lady Angels of Mass. I just want to say I want to thank my council member, Kukorian, for what he has done for the past 28 years. I enjoyed living in that district. I'm going to miss that district. I'm, well, I'm looking forward to Canoga Park. Just give him that message for me, my old councilman, Kukorian. I'm going to be here from the, in this district for the next 17 days. Thanks. Thank you, and again, uh, our apologies for the disruption. Uh, the next speaker is Davy Stump. Is that person here? Uh, apparently not. Uh, uh, the next speaker is, is Wayne Spindler. And by the way, just for the record, Ms. Ramirez is making enough noise outside the council chamber. We can still hear her, so hopefully she'll calm down. Okay, I think and, I yeah. and Mr. Spindler, you have item number 1A, item 2, and general public comment. Uh, do I get 13 and 11 too? 11 and 13. 11 and 13 as well. Yeah. Don't, don't see it on this list, but... Uh, well, I, okay, so that's how it goes. So we have liens and other taxes and evil shit from the chair. Pip, pop, pip. So, I cannot believe we have learned about these things from other council districts. We learned from Monica, we learned from Weezer, and we learned from Uncle Bob Bloom and Blob that we have to waive these things whenever they're on the agenda, because Greg Smith knows, and I was talking to him yesterday, that we're going to use a special word whenever there's liens and they're not waived by the council members. Now, if they get waived, then we don't have to say those magic words that Antonio Ramirez said, right? So if the chair's not going to waive the liens, then I'm going to have to go into additional quotes from Brandenburg versus Ohio. I want to do it. I want to do it. Uh, Mr. Fatso, you better waive this goddamn one and two, man. That, that, that's too much money. Now you get to these projects. The projects, and I mean, this is terrible. We're using taxpayer dollars, and I mean, you go in there and you try to get this housing, and they won't give it to niggers. I mean, that's the problem. They won't give it to niggers. Everybody wants to give it to niggers. I mean, I tried to rent my apartment to niggers, and they said, no, I have to raise the rent if I do it. It's the city policy. It's all Eduardo's fault, too. It's all Mr. Weezer's fault, because you're not giving affordable housing and homeless housing with this government money to niggers. That's a fucking problem. See, that's what it is. And how do we define nigger? A nigger is anybody who doesn't have a roof over their head. A nigger is somebody who has to live in a tent. And a nigger is somebody who goes and honors Nate Holden and forgets to tell him that my grandfather helped put him in office. You I, forgot I to I mention your dues, I think you're off topic. Please, please return to the topic. I'm the first ghetto nigger. And that's why we got to get housing 11 and 13 to prioritize. So page one of the application shall state, you, are you identifying yourself racially and socially as a nigger? If the answer is yes, check the box. Go to Gil Cedillo and get your housing voucher because Armando Herman is a nigger and he's not getting his. He got TRO for simply applying. Now, now you I have your, your one Bennett. minute of public comment. Now we got cake outside and we got all these fat slobs going out there pigging on that cake. No cake for Nuri. No cake for Alexis. No cake for anybody that's too fat. Uh, Mr. You gotta Mr. go on Spindler, a diet. Mr. Spindler, talk I'm the stuff that's the within the subject the matter jurisdiction of the, the city. Isn't that public? It's in a rotunda. 
They're feeding fat slobs. They're feeding pigs <laughs> dangerous sugars. Now, if you're thin, you should get some cake. Now, you take Justin Wesson. Now, he's very thin. He can use a couple of pieces of cake. So, again, let, let, again let's stick to something that's I'm in the subject matter jurisdiction the city, Mr. Spindler. your events, Mr. Fresh Fruit, with all of this horrible shit. So, go get some cake. But keep it away from the fat cunts. Thank you. Next speaker is Arnold Sachs. And you have items number 1A, 2, 11, 13, and general public comment. Yes, uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Arnold Ross Sachs, uh, 11 refers to bridge housing. And so I've been to a few meetings, um, and municipal facilities committee meetings, where they discussed some bridge housing. And they mentioned that the term for the, the lease term is for three years. So is this a three year lease term for bridge housing uh, that they're going to do at this location? And who is the leaser and who is the final tenant. Uh, some of these places are between the city and metro, the city and the county, and the lease is for zero dollars. But then the city will turn around and lease the property to a subtenant and collect money or use it to buy furniture. Why can't the subtenants get donations for the furniture? And how many beds are going to be at this, this, this facility? There's a multitude of questions to ask about this. But you only have one minute, and I wanted to talk. Well, I could talk a little bit more about it. Um, so the questions are: You need to go to some of these committee meetings, and you need to find out where the money is. You just had a celebration for the veterans, 244 years. How many veterans are on the street right now? They can't get bridge housing. But you know what? The city should really investigate. Invest in, although they already are, is underpass housing. You drive through any parts of the city with an underpass, and it's wall-to-wall -wall tents. That program seems to be working very well. And be very, very cautious about July 1st when the, rents, when the minimum wage goes up. The HEAP program from the state, only three words to say about. Heap of shit. It's state, more money to the city. Who gets it? Now let's talk about public comment. So Lieutenant Pat Flood mentioned that it's the 244th birthday of America. He also mentioned something about threats from outside and inside, oh, threats to democracy from outside and inside the co country. He mentioned opportunities. How about housing at the VA for Los Angeles? Call to serve, but don't serve blindly. You know what blind loyalty is? The greatest threat to democracy in today's America. You put blinders on, you see nothing. Every, everywhere, democracy is threatened by the beatdown of due process. Due process, and there was a movie about due process. When the Boston Marathon was run and they had the bombing, the, city, the mayor and the city suspended due process. You're not allowed to question anything. That's a real problem. Even here in the house that Herbie built. But Herbie didn't build this house. I thought this was the John Farrar chambers. So have at it. Thank you, Mr. Sachs. Um, we are going to uh, return to uh, some of the open items. Uh, first item number 1A, if we could open the roll. Close the roll and tally the vote. 12 ayes. That item passes. Item number two. If we could open the roll. Close the roll and tally the vote. 12 ayes. And if we could take items uh, 11 and 13 together. Okay. Mr. Weizar, did you want to be on the queue on one of those? Yes, sir. Item 13, please. So if you'd like to speak to item 13. Great. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And this item uh, allocates some funding that we received from the state for various emergency uh, allocations for a homeless crisis here in the city of Los Angeles. And some of this money is actually going to Skid Row, which is an area that we, as you all know, has the largest number of people living in the streets in the United States. During the day, we have about four to 5,000 people walking around Skid Row looking for services. At nighttime, 2,000 people live on the streets in Skid Row. You can't find that anywhere else in the country but here in Los Angeles. And lately, there's been a lot of attention to this humanitarian crisis, which I welcome, because for too many years, we have not had the urgency that we should apply to Skid Row and correct this hum humanitarian crisis. Uh, we asked for, uh, a year ago, about $20 million to treat the crisis for the emergency that it is. We received those $20 million, and we have al allocated to this date about $5.6 million to help. Today, we are allocating another $2.7 million. These will go to provide bathrooms and showers to address the unsanitary and unhealthy conditions on the street keeping some bathrooms open 24-7, securing a new and improved location for the bin. This is uh, a bin that provides 1,400 voluntary storage bins so that people can keep their personal property safe and off the sidewalk. And it installs drinking fountains to help provide for basic human needs that many of us take for granted. Now, this is not even uh, beginning to scratch at the surface. We need a lot more support the city needs to allocate the additional funding immediately and put the infrastructure in place to be able to put that money to action. We got the money a year ago, and we are now allocating it this late. It's been a year. We need to create more infrastructure in the city that we get that money quickly out the door and get into uh, Skid Row. I've always advocated for a triage-like approach to the crisis that we see there. We need more immediate and urgent response. And uh, with that in mind, uh, the governor uh, has recently announced that he will provide uh, lo local municipalities additional funding. I put in a motion today to request another $20 million to address the crisis we have on Skid Row. But if we do receive that, we have to get that money out the door quickly and create a triage-like response to the humanitarian crisis on Skid Row. So colleagues, I ask for your support and I thank you all for the hard work you all have been doing to ensure that we get our emergency shelters out there. We have a long-term plan in our uh, strategic plan. We've passed HHH to get more permanent supportive housing. Right now, the immediate thing that we're doing is to get the immediate services, emergency services out there. Today's allocation does that, but we obviously need a whole lot more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weizar. So we are going to vote on item 13. If we could open the roll, close the roll, and tally the vote. 12 ayes. Thank you. And now if we could uh, vote on item 11. Please open the roll. Close the roll, and tally the vote. 12 ayes. That item passes, as and, did item 13. And for the record, items 11 and 13 were adopted as amended. Yes. Um, and 13 forthwith, please. Without objection, those will go forthwith. Any other uh, business before us, uh, Madam Clerk? I, I believe there are speakers for general public comment. Yes. Okay. So we will begin with uh, Veronica Duran to be followed by Ted Neubauer and Joanna Aguilera. Good afternoon, I'm Veronica Duran. If you Google Los Angeles affordable housing, it paints a pretty picture, but why am I here? I followed all protocol to get into family housing. They told me to spend the night in the rescue mission where I was beat and left for dead. Nobody has talked to me about this. Nobody apologized to me. All of us are homeless, and they said we can't get into affordable housing because we don't have a mental problem. We don't have a drug problem, but yet 
the caseworkers put their families in there. CEO Andy Bale said, nobody is going to listen to me. Well, I'm here today that somebody needs to listen to me because some moms are not here because they died. See, Andy Bales, with you know, it's so sad when they come to get the three little kids because that mom died trying to get on affordable housing. And she's white. She's not black. She's not Mexican. There's white little ladies that are getting killed out here, too, because they already told me black and Mexicans don't matter. But it's sad when you see them three little kids and the police are coming to pick up them three little kids and it's on the homeless bulletin oh uh, mom is homeless and kids are motherless somebody needs to pay attention we're homeless and we're getting killed I almost got killed Thank I you. almost your, didn't your make it here up. today your time is up your one minute is up you, you need to uh, move on thank you next speaker Please identify yourself. Good morning, City Council. My name is Joanna Aguilera with Arms of Los Angeles. We work to assist at-risk youth veterans and homelesses and anyone in the need of a second chance. Local hire jobs benefit people from across California, across many diverse authentic and class backgrounds, including individuals who want to have good paying middle class jobs. Don't eliminate these good paying jobs for local residents as well as potential future workers in the industry such as members of our organization. Thank you very much. Uh, Ted Neubrauer to be followed by Kayla Guzman and Teresa Flanagan. First of all, thank you for honoring the veterans. Semper Fi. Um, let me see if I can raise the level of this discussion. When a Section 8, when a Section 8 is in a household headed by a veteran, let's make provisions that other members of the household, if the veteran suffers a health crisis, other members of the household are not subjected to eviction. Okay? Let's, let's do something positive. Let's also um, uh, pass an ordinance that allows veterans, homeless veterans who are living in their cars to sign up for community service uh, to offset registration fees and traffic tickets, okay? Let's be positive. Let's build on today's fine meeting. Oh, by the way, uh, my truck is in the impound. Could I get it back? Uh, could I get it back for Father's Day at 7G as in girl? Four uh, seven I'm four sorry, eight but two. your time is up. I'd appreciate it if I could get my truck back so I could finish moving. Sir, your, your time is up. You have to move on. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kayla Guzman. I am here today on behalf of ARMS, the job the industry provides for many people of Los Angeles, offering competing wages, quali quality health care, and in continued training and reliable retirement plans. Don't put those benefits at risk for the families that need it the most. Hard working every day to maintain those opportunities. It's crucial that we keep fighting the industry local and keep it safe. Thank you. Thank you. Teresa Flanagan. Hi, my name is Teresa Flanagan. I'm with ARMS. Workers do not have a college degree, have a hard time completing in today's economy. However, the industry is also a community in hiring local and in the communities they operate in. Don't emulate these good paying jobs for the local residents. I urge you to think about the men and women who are employed by the industry. The economy benefits the industry provided, the city and county. I remember how closely the, it, this industry is re, re, really related in California. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Madam Clerk, uh, what are their businesses before us? Council has motions for posting and referral. Uh, posted and referred. The desk is clear. Members, any announcements? 
if not, uh, if we could stand for uh, adjourning motions. I'm looking to my left. I uh, don't see anything. Looking to my right. Um, seeing nothing there, I will uh, do one adjournment for uh, in the memory of James Arkatov, who was the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra's founder, who also served as principal cellist of the NBC Orchestra, San Francisco Symphony, uh, Indianapolis Symphony, and the Pittsburgh Symphony. Born in Odessa, Russia, Jim emigrated with his parents and two sisters to San Francisco in 1925, and it was there that he emerged as a child prodigy ch cellist and discovered his lifelong love of playing chamber music, often with his boyhood friend, violinist Isaac Stern. At age 18, he was invited to join the Pittsburgh Symphony and later served as principal cellist for the Indianapolis and San Francisco symphonies. Resettling in Los Angeles, he worked as a Hollywood studio musician who worked on movie soundtracks and backed up Ella, Ella Fitzgerald on some of her more memorable uh, recordings. He also worked as a principal cellist of the NBC Orchestra, producing albums under the prestigious RCA Victor label, and he also received accolades for his concerto performances and the cello compositions he premiered in the Evening on the Roof concert series. In 1968, he founded the LA Chamber Orchestra, performing as a soloist and serving as its principal cellist. He took great pride in its emergence as a world-class orchestra and was honored for his contributions last year by the Chamber Orchestra as part of its 50th anniversary celebration. In the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s, Jim devoted most of his energy to photography, a lifelong passion he inherited from his father, who was a celebrated Russian filmmaker. Thanks to Jim's passion for music, coupled with his love of photography, he created collections of thousands of images and audio recordings of many of the world's important musicians and visual artists that are now archived at the Smithsonian, um, at UCLA's Entha Musicology and Special Collections Library, and the USC libraries. He also received several exhibits of his work, including those at, at the Skirball Center, Hammer Museum, and Heritage Gallery. He has permanent collections on view at Cedar sinai Hospital, UCLA Medical Center, and the Coburn School. And uh, I've known his son, Alan Arkatev, Arkatev for many years, uh, as many of us have. Uh, I only met Jim a couple of years ago by coincidence, because when I was walking door to door in my re-election campaign, I found myself at his door and uh, told him I knew his son well and had a very pleasant conversation about uh, his family and his community and his career. Um, and Jim Fett passed away peacefully at home, surrounded by his family at the age of 98 years old. And when, am I, when I met him, I certainly had no idea he, he was that age. Uh, he was sharp as a tack uh, even then. Uh, he is survived by his wife of 63 years, uh, Salome, his uh, son, Alan, and his daughter, Janice, and three grandchildren, Daniel, Jacob, and Michael. And there will be a memorial service for him held at Royce Hall on September 29th, uh, hosted by the LA Chamber Orchestra. And uh, may he rest in peace and be well remembered for all of his accomplishments. Mr. Cedillo, would you like to be on that one or to speak about him? Yes, uh, I don't have the, the details, but I saw this yesterday on, on uh, social media, uh, the passing of Raul Reese, a professor at Cal State Northridge, uh, Dr. Raul Reese with a degree, a PhD from Harvard in education. Uh, Dr. Reese is uh, uh, one of the champions of Chicano studies and in the 60s and 70s was a leader in the uh, Chicano movement. Uh, he was also an editor of a magazine called La Raza. You just saw recently a huge uh, display at the Autry uh, on the photography of that era. And he was a, um, both an editor and a um, photographer. And early in the, in the uh, 60s, or actually 1970 to be more precise, uh, Ren Salazar, the writer for the Los Angeles Times, was killed in a bar called the, the, the um, 
silver, the silver star bar on, on Whittier. It was, he had pulled in there during the uh, unrest, August 29th, and he had pulled in there to meet with some of his colleagues. Uh, the sheriffs, for unknown reasons, thought it was appropriate to f fire a, a projectile in there, and he was killed. And uh, Raul Reese happened to be on the scene at the time and was part of a large inquiry that took place uh, during that time period. Uh, he was able to document it, uh, have photos, uh, testify. Uh, it was a different time, of course. Uh, the accountability was not what it should have been. Uh, it's very unfortunate. Uh, so throughout his career, Raul Reese had dedicated himself to being a champion of education, uh, as I said, a professor, uh, also as a person who worked with young people, uh, instilling in them pride in their community and pride in their uh, background. Uh, as I said, I'm short on the details, but long on the memory of his place and standing in the Mexican-American movement uh, in this city and in this nation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cedillo. Uh, hearing no other adjournments and no other business before us, we are adjourned. <laughs>